The Lord has judged King Saul as unfit to rule the nation of Israel. And now as 1 Samuel chapter 16 opens, God is going to nudge Samuel to stop grieving over Saul and get back into action. God says to him here in verse 1, How long will you grieve over Saul since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite. For I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Well, what this means is although King Saul has failed, the king of kings has not lost control. And let me tell you, beloved, there isn't any panic in heaven, never is, because of something happening down here on earth. Well, off to Bethlehem, then Samuel goes. He's going to offer a sacrifice. He's going to quietly identify Israel's next king. As God instructed, Samuel ends up at the home of Jesse to meet his sons, and he begins with the eldest. Now, Jesse is probably assuming that Samuel is looking for an apprentice to help him. Verse 6 says, Samuel looked on Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, The Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. You see, Samuel's looking for another king like Saul. Tall, handsome, Eliab. Boy, he's got to be the guy. God says, I'm not looking at his height. I'm looking at his heart. Well, after meeting all the sons Jesse brings before him and striking out on all of them, Samuel concludes here in verse 10, the Lord has not chosen these We read here in verse 11, Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? And he said, well, there remains yet the youngest, but behold, he's keeping the sheep. In other words, he's not worth your time. Well, as soon as young David is fetched, the Lord whispers to Samuel, this boy is the future king of Israel. Verse 13 says, Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. Now, there doesn't seem to be any specific announcement here. David probably goes back to tending the sheep. But from the clues that we can put together, David is somewhere around 12 to 15 years of age at this moment. And everybody but Samuel appears to be oblivious to what this anointing is going to mean one day. Now, immediately, uh, David is contrasted here with Saul. David is empowered by the Spirit. But here in verse 14, we're told a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented Saul. Now, this harmful spirit refers to a despairing conviction of sin from God that brought Saul great terror. And the only relief he finds is when he's distracted by soothing music, entertainment, as we see here in verse 23. See, in God's perfect plan, young David now is recommended to come into Saul's service. Why? Because David can play the lyre. That's a a little handheld harp. It's sort of the forerunner of the guitar. And all this simply sets the stage for the drama now here in chapter 17. And the chapter opens with the Philistine and Israelite armies. They are stationed on either side of the Valley of Elah. Neither army has any advantage. So the Philistines offer a rather common challenge of the day. This is going to decide the outcome. It's it's going to be a fight to the death between two representative soldiers. Well, the Philistines send out their representative here in verse 4. We're told it's a champion named Goliath. And Goliath happens to be a giant. Verse 4 says his height was six cubits and a span. That's more than nine feet tall. He's wearing a coat of mail weighing 5,000 shekels of bronze. That's a little more than a hundred pounds here in verse five. Well, every day Goliath comes out and repeats his challenge. Here it is in verse eight. 
Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants. Well, now David shows up with some cheese and crackers one day for his older brothers in Saul's army, and he overhears Goliath's challenge. And he asks the soldiers in verse 26, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? (laughs) You see, the soldiers, you know, they see a giant out there insulting Israel. David sees a giant insulting the living God. They're looking at the size of the giant. David sees the size of God. And eventually, David's courageous insight reaches Saul, who says to David here in verse 33, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth. Well, David recounts his victories, protecting his sheep from lions and bears by the power of God, and and Saul is evidently convicted by David's genuine faith. So he says to David here in verse 37, Go, and the Lord be with you. Well, Saul first here tries to put David into his suit of armor. He, See, he thinks David has to fight Goliath like Goliath fights. Not true. In fact, David rejects the armor. He goes out instead to the brook to pick out five smooth stones for his sling. Now, I got to tell you, there's some evidence in 1 Chronicles 20 and 2 Samuel 21 that Goliath had brothers. So in gathering five stones, David may be preparing to take them on as well, if necessary. I've stood out there on that same hillside overlooking the Valley of Elah, and I've tried to imagine the Israelite soldiers holding their breath as as they watch this teenager walk down there toward the giant. Well, Goliath lets out a roar here in verse 43. He sees David and says, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? He might have seen the shepherd's staff in David's hand, probably the rod stuck in his belt. Israel has sent forth a a boy, a shepherd boy, as if Goliath is a stray dog to be frightened away. And Goliath, he just bellows out here that he's going to feed David to the birds verse 44. And David responds here in verse 45, you come to me with a sword and with a spear, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand that all the earth may know there is a God in Israel. And with that, David lets that smooth stone fly through the air toward its target. (laughs) The Israelite army thinks Goliath is too big to kill. David knows that Goliath is too big to miss. And that stone finds an open spot under Goliath's helmet right at his forehead. And verse 49 says, Goliath fell on his face to the ground. Verse 51, David took Goliath's sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head just in case there's any doubt. David then does two things that are often overlooked. First, in verse 54, we're told that David takes Goliath's head to Jerusalem. It serves as a warning now to the enemies of Israel. Secondly, he puts Goliath's armor in his tent. That means he keeps Goliath's armor as his plunder. We're going to learn later in chapter 21 that David put the sword of Goliath in the Lord's sanctuary, but eventually he gets it back. These become wonderful mementos of faith. I imagine David had Goliath's sword up on the fireplace mantle. Hanging from a peg somewhere nearby was his old slingshot. These are all mementos of God's faithfulness. Let me recommend, beloved, that you keep a mental trophy case or you write down in a journal those steps of faith, those moments of victory, those experiences of God's rescue at just the right moment. Find a way to remember and rejoice over the faithfulness of God. Well, until our next journey together, 
May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.